What's up everybody? This is Whiskey with the Werewolf Hunter. I'm Brian Easton, author of the Autobiography of a Werewolf Hunter series. And tonight we've got something a little special in the whiskey department. This is a vintage bottle of Seagram's VO uh, with an old tax stamp on it of 1970. Now this was seven years old when it went in the bottle. And with it being 1970 on the seal, um, we're just going to go ahead and call it 50 years old. I got this bottle from my great aunt's house once my great, when my great uncle died. At one time in his career, he'd owned a liquor store, and this was in his basement. She gave it to me along with some others. I kept this sealed and safe from consumption for a number of years before I finally gave it to my brother at his wedding uh, not too long ago. He gave it back to me after we toasted his nuptials because uh, he didn't trust himself with it. So I'm going to treat myself uh, to a little bit of it tonight. 50-year-old Canadian whiskey. To your health. And that is smooth. Let me tell you, that's almost like drinking water. It's so smooth. But the flavors are still there. So over the course of the trilogy, uh, Sylvester Logan James becomes, becomes a kind of a hands-on expert in supernatural phenomena. Not because he wants to, but because he comes with the territory. It goes along with the path he's chosen to hunt the, hunt the monsters. And, but the beast knows him as the woodsman. Okay, that's his primary foundation. Uh, not only is that a reference to the, the hero in the Little Red Riding Hood story who comes in at the last minute in some versions and kills a wolf, saves the day, um, but it's also a reflection of who he is as a kind of a mountain kid. You know, he grew up and uh, he could skin a buck and run a trout line, like Hank Jr. would say. And so the last time we talked, uh, we talked about uh, my influences in the, in the occult and uh, my research there and how it applied to my writing. Well, tonight we'll take a little different set of influences to heart and talk about uh, the outdoors part of it. And I've been hunting and trapping for many years. I was, when I was 18 years old, I was, uh, I was helping ranchers and farmers with predator control, foxes and coyotes mostly. No wolves. We don't have uh, we don't have wolves many or any at all in this area of the country. Um, I worked to work for the National Park Service with the Department of the Interior in the late '80s, uh, trapping and eliminating wild boar that was an invasive species and still is down there. And you know I herded stock out west on horseback for a while. So a lot of the aspects wilderness aspects and experiences that you read about in the books uh, they come from I they come from my from real life experience uh, as well as my research into the occult um, not all of it of course you know I have liter take literary license like everybody else but I do draw from my own history uh, with wild animals in the outdoors and and all that so I can you know I could I know the guy that I'm writing about because I've done some of the same things that, that he does in the book. We were talking about the 10 fears last time, the article that I wrote. I remember the name of the website. It was horrorwood.com, which like has still has since gone under. But the, the article was the 10 fears and how I took the 10, 10 classic uh, movie monsters and compared them to different basic fears of mankind. And last week we talked about vampires. Uh, especially in Count Dracula, the Frankenstein monsters uh, come next on the on the slate of uh, of classic movie monsters, and the fear behind them is kind of a kind of a different one. It's not one that you would think you'd associate with um, bodies put together from from random random cadavers. It's uh, the fear of responsibility. Now it seems like today. The idea of taking responsibility for oneself is a is an antiquated idea. It's largely been dismissed, 
and people seem to me anyway too quick to blame the consequences of their actions on someone or something else besides you know taking responsibility for it you know mcdonald's made me fat and and, and what have you so maybe this particular fear doesn't carry as much weight as it should or as it used to but you could doesn't take long to see. I mean, you look at the look at your at the stories, everything from the Garden of Eden to Pandora and the box. Mankind, the human race, are a zealous group of people. I mean, we will we want knowledge, and we're ready to sacrifice just about anything to get it. So, if that's true, that we're that we're ready to pay almost any price for this knowledge and knowledge is power which we're told and it's the best weapon against ignorance and sometimes the fear that goes with that ignorance um, in the discovery in the in that moment of attaining knowledge in the, in the at the apex of discovery there should also be a serious weighing of consequence you know which is a fancy way of saying look before you leap that which is wisdom as far as I'm concerned which is a whole different animal than intelligence or knowledge uh, and so you apply a you know, just apply a little of that but fear of responsibility should be should take precedent in one's mind before you turn that key that opens the floodgates that can't be shut again or you know, takes the cork out of the bottle that releases the genie who will not go back. The person who is responsible for that, the person who turns that key, pulls that cork, they're accountable for their actions. If it, if it was a triumph, they'd take all the credit and the glory. So, you know, if it, does, if it goes badly, like we're talking about with the Pandora or the Sorcerer's Apprentice, uh, who could make the imp do his will but couldn't make him stop again uh, then you know that's something that they have to that they have to deal with so Frankenstein's obsession to create life takes him to gallows and to churchyards out of the laboratory and then engages him in what he himself des describes as filthy work and for all of this his crowning achievement or miscarriage I guess would be a better word for his labors is not the man that he wanted to create but a monster and we all know this but he doesn't take responsibility for his creation so first he's guided by this hubris that he wants to emulate creation and then once he has had a certain amount of success it's not exactly it didn't turn out exactly like he wanted it to but it you know he did bring life to this thing um, he doesn't take responsibility and by not taking responsibility his life is ruined I mean who knows what kind of a story it would have been if he had taken the creature under his wing and tutored him and taught him and cared for him like the father figure that he was uh, that he was going to be but the blame of all that the, the, the blame of his ruination the deaths uh, subsequent deaths of his ward and um, his, or his brother and um, his Justine, they, they, they land with him. It's not necessarily just the monster's fault. So he becomes obsessed, just as obsessed with destroying the creature as he did with bringing it to life in the first place. And he tracks it into the Arctic and we all know how that, how that story goes. But when we consider the story of Frankenstein, we're presented not only with a couple of patchwork amalgams, patchwork monsters. Uh, we're confronted by the cost of ambition and the weight of responsibility that goes with it. Even if we deflect that responsibility, even if we dismiss it like a lot of folks are, are you know, apt to do t today, and I guess they've always done, uh, others will hold us responsible. Even if we say, hey, throw up our hands, and it's like, not me, not my fault, uh, other people will hold us accountable, if, account if accountable we truly are. 
And, you know, all you have to do is take a look at what we've seen in the last few years to celebrities and the like to know that, um, you know, reputations, lives, even le entire legacies can be destroyed by people holding them, holding you to account for what you yourself would not take credit for. And as far as I'm concerned, that's something to be afraid of. Okay, so let's talk shop. Monster hunting. Uh, I mentioned before uh, MB Press and how they had put out the Legends of the Monster Hunter series a few years ago and how I had, had been a contributor uh, to those books. I wrote the foreword for one, the afterword for another, uh, introduced a Monster Hunter's Code in one. And I forgot, I left out uh, that, that there was a fourth book in that series because frankly it had slipped my mind. But uh, this is the Monster Hunter Blood Trails. Now, this is a hardback version of that book. Uh, I, I looked on Amazon and it doesn't seem to be available there. You might be able to get it from Miles Booth if you, want to, if you really want to buy a copy. Uh, he may be able to help you out with that. But in these books, uh, like I told you uh, in one of the previous episodes, there is a lot of really good stories and a lot of good storytellers. Now, along with that, you have a lot of really interesting monster hunters there. You know, you have a modern-day Knights Templar in one of the stories. There's a, a Hasidic mystic who travels the Old West called the Merkaba Rider. And this fellow that I'm going to talk about now, uh, who is one of my favorites from the series, it's, uh, his name is Charles St. Cyprian. And he's written by a, a gentleman known as Josh Reynolds. And you may know, may have heard of Josh through his many Warhammer uh, novels. He's uh, quite a prolific writer and quite talented as well. But this Charles St. Cyprian, who is uh, Josh's character, is the royal occultist to the monarchy of England. And he has, uh, he serves... In the 19, I believe he's the royal occultist in the early 1920s is where the, the stories are set. And he has an assistant named Miss Gallo Glass. And the position dates back, the position of royal occultist dates back to the reign of Elizabeth I when it was known as the Queen's Conjurer. And John Dee was the first Queen's Conjurer, kind of the... the uh, incumbent, the first incumbent to the position. But Josh tells the story of, uh, of St. Cyprian and how his job, of course, is to attend to the British Empire's uh, realm and to protect it from supernatural threats. And a lot of, sometimes these take the form of kind of uh, Lovecraftian type threats. Other times they're good old-fashioned werewolves and uh, and demons but he he is a treat to read and all you have to do is do an Amazon search for Josh Reynolds and you'll you'll pull up a whole boatload of things that he's done his work that I'm familiar with the one that introduced me to the author as well as his his very fascinating character like I said was the Legends of the Monster Hunter series and he appears his character appears in stories in just about all of them I believe. Um, this book here is the only one that I have of his of the of St. Cyprian's solo outing. This is the White Chapel Demon and it was one of two, the other being the Jade Suit of Death. But uh, like I said, Reynolds is just a great storyteller. He weaves very interesting dialogue that's 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 a pleasure to read and he is a the Cyprian is a credit to the monster hunting trade, and Josh Reynolds is a, a credit to his art. So thank you, Josh. So like we usually do, I'm going to answer a question that we got from one of our Facebook friends, and I have these in no particular order, but Kevin wants to know about. Wants me to talk a little bit about Jericho and uh, how how he figures into the series. Uh, if you haven't read the series, of course, you're not going to know who I'm talking about. But in a nutshell, he's a seven foot two Blackfoot 
uh, First Nations bounty hunter who comes after our hero, or our anti-hero, I guess. And he's kind of a mysterious character. Some of the things that happen with him don't quite add up. And i got to tell you, Jericho is one of the most asked-about characters, and what happens with him, one of the most asked-about situations in the entire, in the entire series. Uh, and I'm happy to address it. But I will say this, the, it's kind of a mystery, but the answers are there. They're, they're kind of, I've tried to layer them subtly throughout the series, but the answers are there to the questions you're asking yourselves. Uh, so uh, I, I really don't want to give any more of it away than that because I worked, I worked kind of hard to, to, to keep it, to keep it uh, a secret, but also provide clues and keys to the answers that, that you can find. So it's out there. Keep looking. Uh, the, the other thing he wanted to know, Kevin wanted to know about, was about uh, the magic that uh, Nova Woven and some High Woven can do. Now, if you don't know, Nova Woven and High Woven, these are upper echelons of the lineage of the of the werewolf, uh, the werewolf caste, and they have uh, certain abilities that other lowlier werewolves don't have, such as you know minor sorceries, enchantments. Uh, cantrips, if you will. For instance, they more than once have locked the slide of Sylvester's 45, where it won't fire. They uh, they can do little things, you know, make a door shut, uh, dim lights when there are when there are candles or snuff flames, think little things like that. And this is part of their nature. They're not actually uttering magical spells or anything. It's just some of the things that they can do, being supernatural creatures, and of a higher, on a higher pecking order than the others, because not all of them can do that, of course. Uh, but that's kind of what that is. Uh, they have a little something extra because of their nature. Uh, I'm going to get into it more in the in coming books with Winter Fox and perhaps even with Sylvester. But in my mind, the the really high woven, the high and noble woven. Uh, really bring something to a room with their presence, not just this palpable fear that accompanies them into the room, but and also almost like inducing a panic attack on the uninitiated. Um, sometimes if people feel like they're, like they're starting to, to have trouble breathing or they feel like they're breathing through a wet cloth or something uh, when one of these is around and makes himself known. So this is part of the, this is part of the nature of the beast in a very real sense. So I want to talk a little bit about this contest that we're going to start. And this is a minor one, but whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, I want you to comment below with your favorite werewolf film or or book or your favorite werewolf character from popular uh, popular culture. And I'm going to Next week, I'm going to pick a name at random, and whosoever person name that I choose, uh, I'm going to send them a personalized copy of the latest book, which is uh, the Winter Fox Journals Book One. So I'm going to make that make that out to you, send it to you, no cost of course, because it's a prize. What kind of a prize would it be if I charge you postage? Um, and then just keep watching, and in the weeks to come, I'm going to even I'm going to announce an even bigger contest, something that's got more than just commenting on it, uh, and the prize will be apropos as well. So it's going to be it's going to be kind of a special thing, and I hope a lot of you participate in it when we get to it. Uh, so as always, until next time, you can visit me at werewolfhunter.com. You can send me an email at brian at werewolfhunter.com, and be sure to follow me on Facebook and subscribe to this channel on YouTube. Until we meet again, Good night.